Hello, and welcome to Insider Insights. My name is Mariana Siciliano. I'm an educator in public programs and creative practice. While the Met is temporarily closed, we are bringing the museum to you through a series of up-close looks at objects and exhibitions with Met experts. I'm joined today by Keith Christensen, the John Pope Hennessy Chairman of the Department of European Paintings, who's going to share his reflections on a work of art by Nicolas Poussin and his perspectives on the painting, given the experience of our current moment. Keith, thank you for being here and for sharing this with us. I'll hand things over to you. Such a pleasure, Mariana, and thank you for this, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. I first of all would like to take this uh, occasion to wish you all the best and hope that you are safe. For the past month and a half, I've been working from home. That's where I am now. I happen to live on the Upper West Side with easy access both to Riverside Park and to Central Park. It's made me appreciate even more acutely the importance of nature in our lives, especially at this time of year with the rejuvenation of nature. I try to get out for a quick bike ride in the morning, weather permitting, and a walk with my wife in the afternoon. Our favorite is the North Woods, where the city disappears and you're magically transported mentally to the wilds of nature. For urban dwellers in the 17th century, whether you lived in Amsterdam, Rome, or in Paris, landscape paintings provided a similar mental release from everyday pressures. They provided a moment of reflection and an occasion to consider our place in the larger scheme of things. I cannot think of anything more important to us now, not only because of the pandemic, but given the impact that modern life has had on the environment. And that took me to one of the supreme masterpieces in the Met, Nicholas Poussin's sublime painting of the giant hunter of Greek mythology, Orion, who, having been blinded, is being guided towards the healing rays of the, of the rising sun. It's one of six paintings by this great French artist, which makes the Met's collection the largest in this hemisphere. And as with some of the Met's greatest masterpieces, let's say Bruegel's Harvesters, Van Eyck's wonderful diptych with the crucifixion, Jacques-Louis David's Death of Socrates, we owe the purchase of this picture in 1924 to the brilliant curator Bryson Burroughs. Burroughs was actually trained as a painter. He was very much influenced by Puvi de Chavannes, who he met. And at the Met, he worked in collaboration for a certain period with the great British critic, Roger Fry. Roger Fry was a champion of both Cezanne and of Poussin. Remember that Cezanne was a huge admirer of Poussin. So Burroughs was especially well-placed to appreciate Poussin's enigmatic painting. Why do I say enigmatic? Let's look first at the picture and then discuss a bit the subject that proverbial grain of sand around which Poussin created this remarkable pearl. Framed by the trees of an old growth forest, we see Orion from the back striding down a path. A man stands on his shoulders to guide him. His name is Sedalium. He steadies himself with one hand and points with the other while he looks down and you can see he's in conversation with someone on the ground. Vapors can be seen rising from the forest floor, forming clouds that encircle Orion's head. Standing nonchalantly and observing the scene below with a curious look of detachment is the goddess Diana. We recognize her by her quiver and the arrows and the crescent moon that adorns her hair, for she's the goddess of the moon as well as of the hunt. The edges of the clouds she rests on are tinted with the sun's rays, but they also block the light from Orion's face. On the ground, in shadow, are three further figures. One is in conversation with Sedalion. He's Hephaestus, perhaps better known from his Roman mythological name of Vulcan, and he is pointing the way towards the rising sun somewhere beyond the trees. The two other figures are clearly astonished at the sight of the giant. Note that these three figures are echoed by three stumps of felled trees, one of which has sent forth a branch of oak leaves. 
Poussin always saw his figures interlocked with the forms of nature. In the distance is a magnificent view of a mountainous landscape with beyond the sea, a kind of a bay. On the horizon, you can see a lighthouse. And between the branches at the left can be seen the brightening light of dawn. It's the distant view that reminds us that throughout his career, Poussin was a passionate student of nature. He made frequent excursions into the Roman countryside with his compatriot, Claude Lorraine, to draw from nature. Sometimes the drawings were of distant vistas. Sometimes they were studies of stands of trees with light filtering through the branches and a path leading from the shade into the sun. Often these are done as here with the brush and washes of diluted ink. Though they have not survived, he must also have made countless studies of individual plants for how else could he have arrived at the roots and bark and leaves of those wonderful stumps. We are bound to ask ourselves, were they cut by woodsmen or were they felled by storms? In either case, the new shoot with leaves points to nature's capacity to regenerate itself. From these drawings, he would create his formal compositions back in his studio. Now, Poussin was not interested in the purely topographical views that we see in some of his drawings. His object was to employ the particularities of nature that he studied in the open air to form a poetic idea or to evoke a distant past, what one perceptive critic has called nature viewed through the lens of time. To achieve this goal, he introduced figures taken from Greek and Roman mythology. This brings us to Poussin's decision to put into this beautiful landscape the figure of Orion someone better known as a constellation in the heavens than as a mythological figure. The print on the right is from an, uh, an atlas of stars published in 1603. Now Orion is a problematic figure. He never figures prominently in any of the great narratives uh, from uh, antiquity. The signal event of his story was his rape of the beautiful Merope, whose outraged father then blinded him. Told that the sun would, re would restore his blindness, Orion set off for Lemnos. He later hunted with Diana on Crete and was either killed by her or by a giant scorpion that she summoned when he also attacked her. You can see what I mean, a very compromised figure. Why on earth would Poussin construct a landscape around such an ambivalent mythological figure? Well, scholars have debated this question for over a century and Poussin's two principal biographers, both of whom actually knew this picture, pass over the matter in silence. I don't intend to enter into the intellectual fray. You know, so scholarship is sometimes like those blogs that begin in response to a question and end up in a dispute about something completely different. What I can say is that in 1944, the scholar Ernst Gombrich demonstrated that what Poussin knew of Orion, he almost certainly got from a common reference book, the Mythologie of Natale Conte, in which the myths of antiquity are explained sometimes rather facetiously as allegories. Now, the Mythologie was translated into French in 1627. That's what the edition that I have on the, page, on the screen. And on the page you see on the screen, Poussin would have read how Orion had three fathers, Jupiter, air, Neptune, water, and Apollo, the sun. How this came about is a story that doesn't need to interest us right now. Conte writes, Apollo, that is the sun, draws vapors from the water and raises them into the air. Jupiter is air and Neptune, the spirit of the waters. They are the triple father of Orion, and when brought together, they cause winds, rain, and thunder, Orion. The diffusion of these vapors is signified by Orion's trip to Chios, his blinding, his retreat, and healing through the sun, as directed by Vulcan, signifies nothing less than the circularity and the mutual generation and corruption of the elements. So with this in hand, we get the idea that in some sense the picture represents in allegorical, metaphoric, poetic terms, 
the cycles of nature, and the formation of clouds. What about Diana? Well, we're told that Diana is present as the transforming force because the moon is the means by which the vapors are transformed into rain and storms. So what we have is this peaceful lands in this peaceful landscape is the portent in Orion of the storms of life. That was a recurring theme in the letters of Poussin as he aged and his health declined, and he was 64 when he painted this picture. Orion portending the tempests was a metaphor employed by poets as well as by Poussin. For example, we find it in Edmer, Edmund Spencer in The Fairy Queen. We're told that the patron of the picture, Michel Passard, was enormously erudite. And it may well have been him who suggested to Poussin the theme of the picture, but it was Poussin who turned it into poetic terms. Passard, we know, installed the picture in a gallery especially reserved exclusively for landscapes by various artists, among which was one by Rubens. We might imagine him going from one to the other, appreciating the peculiar vision each artist brought to their encounter with nature. Another encounter, and the one with which I want to end this brief survey of Poussin's marvelous picture, happened in 1821 in London when the picture was exhibited at the British Academy. It was there seen by William Hazlitt, one of the finest critics of his day and an acquaintance of Coleridge, Wordsworth, and of Keats. In other words, part of that tight romantic circle. He wrote an essay about his encounter with the picture, and it's this that I want to read from. Not only because it was so beautifully written and has been so influential, but, be, but because it reminds me of how powerfully pictures such as this can work upon our imagination. So here's William Hazlitt. Orion, the subject of this landscape, is called by Homer a hunter of shadows, himself a shade. He was the son of Neptune and, having lost an eye in some affray between the gods and men, was told that if he would go to meet the rising sun, he would recover his sight. He's represented setting out on his journey with a man on his shoulder to guide him, a bow in his hand, and Diana in the clouds greeting him. He stalks along a giant upon the earth and reels and falters in his gait as if just awakened out of sleep or uncertain in his way. You see his blindness, so his back is turned. Mists arise around him and veil the sides of the green forests. Earth is dank and fresh with dews, and in the distance are seen the blue hills and sullen ocean. Nothing was ever more finely conceived or done. It breathes the spirit of the morning, its moisture, its repose, its obscurity, waiting for the miracle of light to kindle it into smiles. The whole is, like the principal figure in it, a forerunner of the dawn. The same atmosphere tinges and imbues every object. The same dull light, shadowy, sets off the face of nature. One feeling of vastness, of strangeness, and of primeval forms pervades the painter's canvas, and we're thrown back upon the first integrity of things. This great and learned man might be said to see nature through the glass of time. With a laborious and mighty grasp, he puts nature into the mold of the ideal and antique. He was among painters more than anyone else what Milton was among poets. There is in both the same pedantry, the same stiffness, but also the same elevation, the same grandeur, the same mixture of art and nature, the same richness of borrowed materials, the same unity of character. Neither the poet nor the painter lowered the subjects they treated, but filled up the outline in the fancy and added strength and reality to it, and thus not only satisfied, but surpassed the expectations of the spectator and the reader. This is held for the triumph and the perfection of works of art, to give us nature such as we see it as well, and deserving of praise, to give us nature such as we have never seen it, but have often wished to see it, is better and deserving of higher praise. He who can show the world in its first naked glory, can recall time past, transport us to distant places, and join the regions of imagination to those of reality, and does it with simplicity, with truth and grandeur, is Lord of nature and her powers, and his mind is universal, and his art 
the master art. Well, Hazlitt's idea of transporting us to the regions of the imaginations especially resonates with me. And the idea of the first integrity of things has enormous meaning, I think, right now. They make, I believe, Poussin's great picture particularly important for this moment that we're in. And it's this moment that I wanted to recall for you, missing this picture as I do, by not being able to visit the Metropolitan. We all look forward to its opening. I want to thank you for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in the museum. Meanwhile, stay well.